Hey guys, all right, we're back for lab number four. Um, we're doing, today we're doing a uh, scientific method. Uh, there'll be a handout on that. It'll look like this. And um, it'll be online. Uh, obviously as everything else is, unfortunately, because we're uh, online for the semester. So um, let's see, we're gonna do scientific method. We're gonna do transport across the plasma membrane. We're going to do um, and osmosis, and we would normally do a, an experiment in class, and so I'll go through the experiment in class and talk to you about that and how that works. Then we'll talk about the cell cycle and uh, somatic cell division. We're not going to talk about, talk about the germ cells, which is the uh, sperm and, and uh, eggs. We're going to talk about just somatic, which means soma, meaning body, so body cell division, somatic cell division. Um, also, and I did sell you to diversity last time. I'll, I'll skip most of that, but I'll bring it back just because that'll be an introduction to histology tissues that we're doing next time. <clears throat> so that'll be uh, lab five will be histology. And get ready for that because that'll be a long, long uh, lecture and uh, um, there's a lot of tissues to go over. So uh, anyway, so we'll do cellular diversity. So, and here's a little quote for you. So this is from Stephen Hawking who uh, wrote a brief history of time. He's a very famous uh, physicist and came up with several theories that are uh, really pretty startling. But anyway, um, the quote from him is, one, remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Two, never give up, give up work. Work gives you meaning and purpose and life is empty without it. And three, if you're lucky enough to find love, remember it is there and don't throw it away. He was uh, confined to a wheelchair for most of his life, uh, but he still wrote books and did work. So, um, so whenever this course is, feels tough to you, just remember that um, other people have gone through tough things too, and you can you can deal with it. So, <laughs> so encouraging words, I, hopefully. Okay, next slide. So the scientific method. What is the scientific method? Well, it's a series of steps or a process that every, all scientists use to ask and answer questions about the natural world. Um, truly, when you're doing science in the lab, you don't do each of these steps every single time. You don't lay them out, I should say, every single time and say, say what is each one of these steps. Um, you just sort of do the work and you uh, create um, hypotheses as you go along. Um, and but you don't uh, lay out every single one of these in your lab notebook every single time. Okay, so but the be this is a really good description of how the scientific process works. So first we start off with an observation, and then you ask a question about the observation. Then you uh, produce an educated guess, which we refer to as a hypothesis. Then you do an experiment to test your hypothesis. You look at the results, and from those results you draw a conclusion, and you then can either um, discard your hypothesis and create a new one or your hypothesis is reinforced. It's basically one or, one or the other. Uh, or, you know, so you so either um, discard your hypothesis, mo modify your hypothesis, or, um, uh, or, or you just, just, your basic hypothesis is just confirmed, so you do, you will do more experiments to make sure that it actually is true. So, so it's, um, this series of steps is just a just a series, and you do this multiple times, trying to uh, figure out how something works. So, like, what kind of observation would you would you know would you make? Uh, well, you can do think about this in the lab and think about really complicated things, but um, you can also think you know just look around your room where you are, and um, observe some things. So one things you one things you could uh, think of is like. Well, leaves are green. The grass is green. It might be a little brown now. It depends on how much it's been raining. Um, the sky is blue is another observation. Or maybe the sky is, is white or gray, uh, depending on, on what the weather is. But let's, let's start with uh, something like uh, the sky is blue. So you observe that. And most people, <clears throat> they sort of observe things, but they never ask the next question. So what's the next question? Well, the question, the questions you ask are, Usually why, uh, you ask how, you could ask what, when, and where, um, the, the uh, you know, journalism type five, you know, five questions, you know, how, what, when, where, and why. Um, and then you, uh, but then you, so you ask the question, so let's say why, so why is the sky blue? Well, 
uh, you can make up by hypothesis that, uh, that well, let's see, um, sky is blue because, uh, well, we know what well, we know, and you can base your hypothesis on previously identified information. So you can say, well, my hypothesis is I know that light can be broken into different wavelengths if I use a prism. And you've seen the rain, you've seen rainbows, and so you've seen the prism, so you see red on one end and blue on the other. So maybe red is being, um, uh, you know, I'm not, maybe I'm just not able to see the red red light, okay? And um, so you say, okay, there's my my hypothesis is going to be in a certain form. It's going to be in a format of um, I observe this, so so and I and I think this is what's happening. So this is what I would expect to happen if I did a certain experiment. So uh, what you say is an if then statement. So um, so you say the sky is blue because I can see blue light. So we can do some experiments. We can take um, air and we can shoot uh, light at it and see if blue gets um, deflected more by the air molecules in there than red light does. And it turns out it does. And so what happens is when the when the sun is there, it's shining shining down towards you. The the, the blue light gets scattered by the molecules. The red light tends to, tends to just go um, go. Uh, past you, so you get more scattering of more blue light down towards you. And as you are, as the sun is lower in the sky, there's uh, there's so much uh, air molecules there that it scatters all the blue light away, and mostly what you see is the red light coming through. This. That's why the, the sun looks a lot redder when it gets yellow and redder when it gets close to the horizon, because there's so much atmosphere for it to go through. The red light can come all the way through, straight through the, those molecules uh, in the atmosphere, but the blue light gets scattered all over the place, and so you don't see nearly as much blue when the um, uh, the sunlight when it's coming down towards you. So uh, when, it's, when the sun's low in the sky, so <clears throat> and the sky is more red and all that, so. So you can do an experiment. So there was our experiment. We take a like a glass jar and shoot you know light through it and see if the blue is reflect is refracted more than more than red. And we take our results and we draw a conclusion saying, okay, so our conclusion is that the blue light is uh, refracted more than the red light is. So that's why the the sky looks blue because we see those those uh, air molecules. The light bounces off of it and eventually bounces down to our eye, but the red light um, takes off in all different directions and just keeps going. So. So there's there's a one example. We're gonna go through some other examples as well. So, uh, so one and two. Let's start off with uh, an observation about the world around you. You get up one morning and your car won't start. Everybody probably everybody's experienced this at some point. I know I have. Um, so then you you formulate a, formulate a question about your observation. So you, well you'd say why won't the car start? And uh, so there's several possibilities. You immediately start thinking of those. What those are. Um, so you, you form a hypothesis, an educated guess. So if I do this, then this will happen, an if-then statement. So you must uh, state your hypothesis in a way that will allow you to answer your original question and in a way that, that it can be easily measured or tested. So um, one, uh, one example hypothesis is, um, is uh, if I change the battery, then the car will start because I think the battery is dead. So what you've done is taken your, your conclusion, uh, the battery is dead, is what you conclude is probably happening, and uh, what you guess is probably happening, and you put that into your hypothesis. So I think the battery is dead. So if I change the battery, then the car will start. So now you've created not only um, the, the observation and a reason for that observation, uh, an answer to the question why the car won't start, um, why won't the car start? I think the battery is dead. So if I change the battery, um, the car should start. Then the car should start. So you've created the statement that can be tested. So so all you have to do now is do your experiment and change the battery, and then turn the ignition and see if the car starts. So um, and when you're doing this, these variables there are variables that are in your experiment that you need to be aware of. There is the independent variable here, the dependent variable, and control variables. So control variables are all the conditions that the experimenter attempts to keep constant. So, um, and when you do an experiment, the best way to do an experiment is only change one thing at a time, okay? So try not to 
uh, change more than more than one thing because the experiment gets really hard to interpret if you change more than one thing. So uh, the dependent variable is the conditions being measured. So in this case, it's will the car start or not? Okay, that's your dependent variable. So what is being measured? The independent variable is the conditions being changed by the experimenter. So I'm going to change out the battery. So that's my independent variable is the battery. So the battery's independent variable down here. Where's my cursor? There it is. Independent vari variable is the battery. Dependent variable is the car ignition. So whether the car starts or not. Um, and then control is all the other conditions in the car. You must, must keep those constant. So um, let's say... Um, uh, for instance, that your car was wouldn't start because you're out of gas, okay? And so, but you say, oh, I think my battery's dead, so you replace, so you replace the battery, okay? And your car still won't start. So then you go, okay, that wasn't the problem; it's a different problem. But if you change both the battery and put gas in the car at the same time, you've changed two things, and now you don't know why your car didn't start. Were you out of gas, or was it because of the battery? You don't know, you can't tell, you can't interpret your experiment. So this is a simple experiment, but you can see it would get really complicated if you're working with things that are invisible uh, chemicals or cells that you, that are difficult to see with a naked eye or can't be seen with a naked eye. Um, so that's why you have to be very careful when you're designing your experiment to only change one thing at a time if you well, possibly can. Uh, it's valid to change multiple things <clears throat> as long as you acknowledge that you are changing multiple things and it's more difficult to uh, interpret the results. But so you generally try to change just one thing in experiment. Okay, um, next slide. So you've uh, you've done your experiment. You analyze your results, and so the car started or did not start. So so then you reach your conclusion, and does the experimental result, result refute or support your original hypothesis? Uh, the the dead battery was the reason it didn't start. So hypothesis is not falsified or hypothesis is true. It's a little more accurate to say hypothesis is not falsified because that's a little bit less strong a statement. Um, or you can say that the dead battery was not the reason the car did not start. So then you have to look for a different reason. Maybe you're out of gas. Maybe the battery cables are bad. Maybe um, there's corrosion on the battery terminals. Maybe the starter's gone bad. Um, let's see. So... Um, maybe your, uh, your radiator is out of fluid. The car will start uh, with, when that happens either. So, so anyway, those are some other things that you could also test as well. All right, next slide. So here's a, another experiment that we can look, talk about um, using the scientific method. So you have an observation. This, and this one comes from the department. They put this on the uh, scientific method handout. Helen missed her menstrual period. So then you say, yeah, the question is, Okay, why? Why did she miss the menstrual period? So let's form a hypothesis for that. Well, let's see. You can say, well, Helen's pregnant. Okay, there's, there's an easy one that probably everybody thought of uh, immediately. Um, so you can say, um, so you can say, well, I, you know, I think. Uh, why did she miss her, per her period? Because I think she might be pregnant. So if she's pregnant, then. Uh, then she will get a positive result on a pregnancy test. So that gives you your experiment. So that's your hypothesis. So your experiment is then, well, let's do a pregnancy test. So she goes and she pees on the stick and waits a couple minutes, and then you get a little plus sign, or maybe it actually says on there, you know, you're pregnant, yay, or whatever. Um, or depending on your situation, maybe it's you're pregnant, yay, you know, whatever. Um, and then uh, you reach your results. Um, so you read your results off your off the pregnancy test, and then you reach a conclu conclusion: yes, I'm pregnant, or no, I'm not pregnant. So let's say she missed her menstrual period. What are some other? Um, and a lot of times, what what I would do in lab is try to think of different way instead of just going through and, and kind of um, bullying my way through this and just like you you come up with one hypothesis and you do an experiment for that and it turns out to not be the case, then you go back and do another one without thinking through all the possibilities. What I like to do in the beginning is, is just say, okay, Helen, Mr. Menstrual period, period, what are all the reasons for that that could possibly be? And let's lay them out so we can form various hypotheses and then pick the best one to test um, out of all the possibilities. So that's so menstrual period, that'd be easy to test that one. Uh, what are some other reasons? Well, it could be a hormone imbalance that could be causing that. Uh, possibly even could be that uh, maybe an ovarian cyst as well could be um, could be that she's uh, overweight 
could be that she's underweight. She's exercising a huge amount. Um, you know, is, is this a one, you know, is she, are there questions to ask? And this, this kind of fits into clinical um, situations, you can you ask the patient history. So, well, you know, you missed your period, period, but does that happen often? You know, do you do you miss one every or every other month, or um, you know, do you, are your periods ir irregular? So you ask uh, certain questions to get a patient background, and then you and you can uh, that helps inform um, the hypotheses that you're that you're going to make about what's going on. So, if uh, if it's an acute thing, she says no. You know, I've been absolutely like you know absolutely regular my whole life uh but all of a sudden i missed it then you, you go okay you know are you dating anybody you know that kind of thing so you ask those kind of questions and ask um uh ask further questions and try to get more information and that can inform your hypothesis and, and narrow down their hypotheses so you know you don't have to worry about and you can look at their weight and see and ask about uh are they exercising a lot? Have they increased their exercise you know, recently? All those kind of things. So, um, so all those kind of background information can inform your uh, the choice of hypothesis that you want to test first. And you may have to go through and test two or three hypotheses on this. So anyway, so that's a um, a way that the scientific method can be used in um, uh, in, a, in a sort of a clinical setting. Um, one thing that that you may uh, may be realizing as you as you go through all these steps is that Lots of times humans jump from observation to conclusion, okay? There's no experiment, there's no hypothesis, there's no question, especially no question. And that's the biggest, one of the biggest parts is to ask the question why or what or how or um, when or uh, those kind of questions. So like for instance, let's say you're walking through a grocery store or Walmart or whatever and there's somebody who's acting really funny and you see them and you're like, oh man, Immediate conclusion, uh, they're on drugs, okay? I'm going to stay away from them. I'm just going to go somewhere else, and, uh, and you, know, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's a bad person to be around. Well, you could, ask, you could ask a question, okay, this is weird. It's in the middle of the day. You know, maybe they're drunk. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're on drugs. Maybe they're not. Um, maybe there's, is there another possibility uh, for them acting oddly in, uh, in Walmart? And perhaps they... Uh, perhaps they have um, some sort of um, hormone or maybe a glucose imbalance, or maybe they have maybe they're having a stroke. Um, maybe they're actually having a medical problem rather than um, being on drugs. You know, there's um, you know middle of the day. It's you know they're acting weird. You know, it could it could be uh, could be drugs or it could be something else or it could be uh, other things as well. So so always you know think a little more broadly and don't jump immediately to a conclusion. Think about what it is. Form hypothesis. And uh, you know the uh, you know and observe uh, a little bit more before you jump before you form a conclusion before you before you jump to a conclusion. So anyway, all right. Next slide. Okay, so uh, so that's all the scientific method. What we're uh, on the last slide. What we're going to do is um, there's a uh, uh, online. I'll post the scientific method handout on there, and there's an activity to do with that. Um, basically, it's graphing. Um, what it is, is actually holding your breath. This activity we would usually do in class. You hold your breath and you take your pulse. Okay? And you take your pulse either at the wrist and uh, hold down there and you can, you can take your pulse rate or you can do you know, carotid pulse, either one. Let's see. Um, and um, so what you do is you take your pulse rate and then you... Um, uh, uh, just normally, and then you hold your breath for 15 seconds, and then take your pulse, and then hold your breath for 15 seconds, and take your pulse, and then hold your breath for 15 seconds, take a pulse. And that's three trials, and then you'll do it, do this uh, experiment again. But you're, now you're going to take, hold your breath for 30 seconds, and then take your pulse. 30 seconds, take your pulse. 30 seconds, take your, take your pulse. And then, after, then the the next one you're going to do is you're going to hold your breath for 60 seconds, and then take your pulse. And 60 seconds, take your pulse. And 60 seconds, take your pulse. And C, does your pulse rate go up or go, does it go down? And you want to take your pulse. One of the easiest ways to do it is just count, is take your pulse for 15 seconds and then multiply that by four so that you get a full one minute pulse rate. Okay. And so then, uh, so you're gonna have a little chart that you're gonna fill out on the uh, on the the handout um, that's gonna be online, and you fill that out, and then you summarize all your results. 
and then we can tabulate them all as a class and come up with and graph the results and see what the average is and see if does, does our average pulse rate go up or down with holding our breath. So, um, and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll post on momentum a little bit more about how, how we're going to I'm going to do that and when I want the results back and all those kind of things. So anyway, all right. So we also have, uh, we're all, today, uh, we're going to, next topic is we're talking about um, membrane transport. Okay. And uh, we're talking about cell, the cell membrane and things going across the cell membrane. So um, we're going to talk about, in this case, osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water across the plasma membrane. And in order to model a plasma membrane, what you can do is you can use something called dialysis tubing. And this is what you use in actually dialysis. And it allows uh, water to pass across, but ions and lar or large uh, molecules do not pass across this membrane. So you have a membrane and basically it has holes in it so water can go through the membrane, okay? But ions get stopped by the membrane. They aren't able to go, th go through these little tiny holes, okay? I'm showing them slits, but think, think of those as, as holes, okay? The water can go through, but um, salts cannot. So what we're going to do is we're going to put um, what's called normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, into two beakers, okay? And I, I have a diagram of this. And then we're going to put a little bags that have a salt solution in them. So the two beakers will both have 0.9% uh, sodium chloride in them. Then we're going to put a bag with 0.9% sodium, so, sodium chloride in that uh, beaker. So since you have the same concentration inside the bag as outside the bag, you figure that nothing's going to happen. Water's going to flow back and forth across that dialysis tubing, and the, and the, and the weight of that bag is probably going to stay the same. The other beaker, we're going to have 0.9% sodium chloride in there. Then we're going to put a little bag that has 20% sodium chloride in there. Okay, So you put that in. Now with osmosis, which is the movement of water, you have lots of sodium chloride inside the bag and not as much around outside the bag. So what happens is you have what's called a concentration gradient, okay? And um, concentration gradient makes the water uh, move in a certain direction. So it's going to try to move into the bag and to create a sa the same concentration inside the bag as is outside the bag. So I'm going to show you diagrams of this in a second. So what's going to happen is the bag's going to swell, and then what we usually do is we take these bags and we weigh them every five minutes for 20 minutes. And usually what we do is we're weighing these and I'm talking. So um, so anyway, what's going to happen is water's going to go into the bag with the 20% sodium chloride in there. It's going to weigh more than the, the bag that has 0.9% because no water is going to water the net water movement into and out of the bag is going to be the same but there's going to be a lot more water go into the 20 percent sodium chloride bag so it's going to swell and, and weigh more after 5 10 15 20 minutes okay so that's the experiment so um, next slide okay so we're talking about diffusion or osmosis and uh, osmosis is basically diffusion but just diffusion of water so um and uh so there's different mechanisms that uh, molecules get across membranes. And the, uh, the basic mechanisms are, and there are two mechanisms, there are two categories. There's passive, okay, and there's active. So the passive mechanisms are all these here, right? And this is active. Active means it requires adenosine triphosphate, ATP, <clears throat> okay? And uh, it requires ATP, it requires energy to move molecules across the cell membrane. Uh, passive um, membrane transport uh, does not require energy, so that's why it's referred to as passive. It doesn't require um, ATP energy to move things across, the, I should say ATP energy to move things across the cell. It requires potential energy, it requires a concentration gradient uh, so a higher concentration on one side and a lower concentration on the other side for um, for transport to, to occur. Uh, for And it's essentially diffusion across um, either the membrane itself. So you can have simple diffusion here. You have what's called facilitated diffusion. Okay. Facilitated diffusion means that you have a channel. You have a protein that has a central hole in the middle of it and and so ions can go through either way out or in so so it's 
facilitated in the sense that you have have a channel there. So, but you still, but for ions to move across, you have to have more, a higher concentration on say out, outside versus inside or inside versus outside. Either way, um, but so they're going to diffuse from a an area of higher higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And I know I showed this slide uh, last time, so you guys this will be very familiar. This is actually in chapter three, I think, of your or unit three in your book. So, but um, I'm talking about this because we're talking about osmosis in this in this um, uh, lab here. So, uh, facilitated facilitated diffusion. We talked about that before, and that also requires a carrier molecule. But there tends to be some binding of the um, of the molecule that's being transported. Uh, to the protein, which then, when it binds, it produces usually a shape change, and so what'll happen is it'll bind to it, and then it'll open up and release that molecule out, and so, and then it'll, it'll go back to its normal shape, and another molecule binds to it, and it goes and moves to a different shape and releases that out. So that's kind of the idea of, of facilitated uh, diffusion, or it is the idea. So, and then osmosis is, in a sense, uh, a version of facilitated diffusion. Um, you have a specific channel called an aquaporin. That's here. You can see that word there, aquaporin. Um, so it allows um, water to go th go through the um, uh, plasma membrane. Because remember, the plasma membrane is is composed of these hydrophilic heads and hy hydrophobic tails, and a hydrophobic tail and hydrophilic head down here. So water, since it's charged, um, it has a uh, it's a polar molecule. So it won't go across that neutral part uh, where there's, there's no charge in the middle of the membrane. It will stay outside. And it likes you know the, the uh, hydrophilic heads because those are slightly charged on there. <clears throat> so it'll stay out there and it'll stay inside the cell, but it won't go across that, that membrane um, unless there's a channel there. And so there's, a, so there's, a, there's an aquaporin channel that so there's a hole in the middle of it that water can go into and out of. So a um, active transport. That requires ATP, and so active transport, it can transport substances against a concentration gradient. So if you have a lot of, say, calcium ions outside the cell, and you have a few inside the cell, you can pump more calcium ions out from inside the cell and make it even more concentrated on the on the outside of the cell. So you can go from inside to outside against the concentration gradient. All the other the passive mechanisms all are uh, mechanisms that work with the concentration concentration gradient. So, and you'll see an active transport mechanism. We'll talk about that in the um, sodium potassium pump, um, and we'll talk about that when we get to neurons and um, and how it, that produces a charge across the membranes. You'll also talk about that in lecture as well. So, so here we are. Passive transport um, does not require ATP. Includes simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and um, let's see, and um, uh, which are both B and C. Um, so you have facilitated diffusions of ions through a channel or through a, a carrier mole, a carrier protein. Either one, okay. And then you have osmosis um, does not require uh, expenditure of ATP energy. Then you have active transport, which does require ATP, um, and and that'll be against a concentration gradient. And the uh, ATP is supplied by the mitochondrion of the cell. Okay. Um, so we're going to focus mostly on this aquaporins, the water water molecules, in the experiments we're going to do. Okay. Next slide. So here's a there's that view you've seen this before of the pl uh, plasma membrane and so you have a protein here that has a pore in it so stuff can go through this pore and come into the cell or it could go the other way and go back out of the cell too either way so you can go into or out of the cell depending on, on where the concentration gradient lies then you have these other other proteins that are associated with the cell membrane some of them are transmembrane like like this one, this is transmembrane here, this one is transmembrane here, or you have some that are only in one layer, uh, or mostly in one layer of the, of the uh, this is also transmembrane too, because it goes all the way up and through and all the way across the membrane. So 
<clears throat> and these these little guys here are sugar molecules. So there's that's a sugar molecule. There's a sugar molecule. There's a sugar molecule. There's another one, and there's another one. So that's uh, some sort of some sort of carbohydrate. Um, carbohydrate molecule that helps give that protein its distinctive function um, uh, on, on the surface of the cell. Okay, and you know, so the carbohydrates are generally on the surface of the cell. It helps in, they help sometimes in recognition of, uh, of proteins uh, to self, uh, or they may have other functions as well. Anyway, the point is that you have this channel of some kind that allowing uh, molecules to go into and out of the cell. Next slide. So active transport versus passive transport, what you have is um, potential energy. So here a, a bike rider uses what's called kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and he goes up the hill. So he's putting energy into it. He gets to the top of the hill, and now he's got what's called potential energy because he can coast down the other side of, the, uh, side of the hill, and that potential energy is lost as he's coasting down the hill. So Potential energy means that there is a difference in energy between one state and another. And so in this case, we're talking about diffusion. So we have potential energy. We have a um, uh, higher concentration of, of stuff on one side of a plasma membrane uh, versus the other side of the plasma membrane. So passive diffusion works because of potential energy. It's stored kinetic energy. Um, the driving force behind the passive uh, transport of passive diffusion is the concentration gradient. Okay, and um, so and it can be simple diffusion or facilitated, facilitated diffusion, and which requires a protein to do to do it, but no ATP energy. Next slide. So diffusion is the movement of solute. Solute is um, things that are dissolved in a solution or in a solvent. So we have a beaker here, and we have water, and we add salt, so we add little dots, they're supposed to all be dots of salt, and each of those is salt, so each of those is sodium chloride, which is a, sodium is positive, chloride is negative, um, so you have all those ions in there, so, so the sodium chloride is the solute, okay, and this would be, and the solvent in this case, we're just saying the solvent is water. Okay, so diffusion is mo movement of solute from high concentration to low concentration. Diffusion is passive; has no no net energy of it, uh, energy input from the cell. So energy for diffusion uh, energy for diffusion comes from the concentration gradient. Concentration gradient is defined as having two different concentrations of the same substance at two different points. And you can have it in one solution. I could have a concentration gradient where I have a beaker and I drop in a, a colored tablet. You might do this uh, coloring Easter eggs or something like that. And you drop in a colored tablet and you notice that there's a lot of color around here. But there's not as much color over on the right side. Okay, there's lots of color here. And there's not as much on the, on the right side. Eventually, the color will diffuse across, and the whole thing turns blue eventually as the as the tablet dissolves, as the concentration gradient evens out across the across the uh, the, the bowl or the cup or, or the beaker or whatever you've got your uh, your colored tablet in. And you have the same thing happen with uh, you put sugar into uh, Say your iced tea and you stir it up and you'll see little crystals of sugar at the bottom and eventually those as you keep stirring those will, will eventually dissolve and then you distribute the um, sugar throughout the tea and so you have sweet tea. Um, you can uh, if you throw sugar in uh, put some sugar in your tea and taste it immediately it won't taste sweet because the sugar has not had time to dissolve. You have all the sugar at the bottom so you have a concentration gradient of a lot of sugar here and almost none at the top where you're drinking from. So. But if you let it dissolve, then the tea becomes sweet. So then you've distributed your concentration gradient so it's an even gradient across the whole solution. Anyway, next slide. Rate of diffusion. Rate of diffusion depends on several factors. These are how steep the concentration gradient is, the temperature, and the size of the particles. So generally, usually the smaller the size, the faster diffusion occurs. The steeper 
the concentration gradient, the faster it occurs, and the higher the temperature, the faster diffusion occurs, the higher rate um, uh, diffusion uh, will occur. So the rate of diffusion increases if you have small particle size, steep concentration gradient, and high temperature. So in general. Um, next slide. So, so here's the tablet I was talking about, or colored sugar cube, whatever you want to call it. So you see the go, you drop it in here, and then it starts diffusing. And you see a little bit of color all around the sugar cube, and then the color starts distributing more and more within the beaker. And finally, the, the sugar and dye molecules are, are evenly distributed across, uh, throughout the beaker. And uh, so you have, um, or throughout the solution in the beaker, I should say. Um, so there, so there is no more concentration gradient in in this beaker here on the on the right here. So, okay, next slide. Osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of solvent from a solution with a lower solute concentration to a solution of higher solute concentration through a selectively permeable membrane. So, what does that mean? Well. So solvent, uh, generally when we're talking about solvent, we're usually almost always talking about water. So this would be movement of water across, and this would be a, we're going to call this our selectively permeable membrane. Okay, so we'll be right there. And then our solvent is water, and we'll have water on both sides. So we have this selectively, selectively permeable membrane. So you have a membrane that has holes in it so stuff can get through. Well, in this case, only certain things get through, get through, and if we can pick our membrane correctly, we'll pick one that only lets water through but does not let ions or other large molecules go through. So, if I have a beaker, and so I'll make this into a beaker, so I have water on both sides of my membrane, okay? But then I put a whole bunch of salt on this one side What's going to happen? Well, what happens is that there's a lot of the water can move, but the salt can't. So the salt's going to stay stay the same. What happens is you have a concentration gradient. So you have lots of salt here. You have sodium chloride here. You have lots of it. Oh, let's see. Sorry. I'll just write that out. You have lots of Sodium chloride on the right side, and on the left side, you have none. Okay? So what's going to happen is the sodium chloride can't go across this membrane over. It can't do that. Okay? It can't do that. Draw a little X's. But water can go this way. So what will happen is the volume starts increasing on the right side. So the volume starts going up over here because you're always trying to equalize that concentration gradient and make it the same on both sides. So it's going to, so it's going to raise that water up on that. Let's see. Actually, I'm going to try to do this and raise that water up on that, on that side. Okay. So I was trying to do it with the picture I just drew. <laughs> so, um, so solvent is going to move to the more concentrated solution. Okay. And to try to dilute it until the concentrations are equal or approximately on each side. So, and then movement, net movement of water molecules will cease if the concentration gradient is gone. You'll still have uh, movement of water molecules back and forth across the, across the membrane, okay? But it'll be the net movement, so you, have, you won't have like a whole bunch move and then a few move. You'll have, say, four move and four will, come, will come, go back the other way. So you have net movement will be zero. All right, next slide. So here's a, a YouTube um, experiment. So you have your selectively permeable membrane down here, okay, right there. And we have solute molecules. So this could be uh, whatever is dissolved in the solvent. So it could be, we could call it sodium chloride, just for kicks, okay. So it's sodium chloride dissolved here. And then we have solvent molecules, those are little, little balls. And so let's call that water. So what's going to happen is the water molecules are going to try to, it's going to, this, these two hat, two sides are kind of trying to equalize, equalize out um, the concentration gradient. So water is going to start trying to move across the selectively permeable membrane. Salt molecules can't go 
that way. So the water has to is going this way. So what happens is the volume increases on the right side. So the volume goes down on the left and up on the right. Okay, and you can actually do this experiment. You can actually uh, do it at YouTube and let it sit for several hours, and you'll see the volume go down on one side and up on the other, even against the force of gravity. Okay, so the movement is due to what's called hydrostatic pressure. So it's hydro meaning water, static pressure. Next slide. Okay, so um, so here's um, compared diffusion and osmosis. So here's osmosis is movement of solvent. of solvent and since we're in biology we're almost always talking about water if you're in chemistry you could be talking about all kinds of different things usually we're almost always talking about water so in this case you have a highly concentrate you know concentration concentration is high on the left side and it's low over here so your water or your solvent is going to move that direction so what happens is that the volume increases on the left side and the volume decreases on the right side so you can see how that happens it goes down it goes sorry I'll try to do this with with the picture it goes down and goes up to the right yeah so as as uh, osmosis occurs diffusion is the movement of solute molecules. Okay. So let's call these sodium chloride just for kicks. Okay. So we have a high, again we have a high concentration on the left, a low solute concentration on the right. So what happens is solutes move this direction. Okay. But this membrane, uh, in this case, is permeable to both water and solutes. Okay, so water goes through. So water goes one, goes one direction. So the fluid goes this direction. Okay, and the solutes all go this direction. And so what you end up with, the solutions stay equal on both sides, but the numbers of solute molecules become equal on, on both the right and the left sides. So, hey, okay, next slide. Here's another picture of it. Uh, so um, diffusion and concentration gradients. So diffusion, we're talking about movement of solute molecules. So solutes in a solvent is a solution. So solutes, uh, sodium, potassium, uh, chloride ions, could be oxygen, could be uh, calcium, could be glucose, all that kind of stuff. Solu solutes are dissolved in a solution. The concentration is the amount of solutes in a solution. We can measure uh, molarity or percent. So we might say it's a 0.9% sodium chloride solution, which is also called normal saline. Um, so 0.9%, you'll run across that a lot in healthcare, 0.9% sodium chloride is, sorry, I got the hiccups there for a second. Normal is also called, is also called normal saline, or sometimes it's just called saline. Okay, a gradient is a difference in the amount of something um, on in one area versus another, and so iced tea. Um, use it. Uh, we talked about iced tea a second ago about how you sweeten up your tea. Usually in the South, it's hard to find sweet tea in the North. It was a bummer. I was married to one from Michigan, and it was hard to find sweet tea up there <laughs> in Michigan. So also hard hard to find. Um, uh, you couldn't find. You know, we go we go to breakfast and they didn't have grits either. So you know. You know sideline of side story about detroit uh anyway it's, it's, it was a great place to visit we had, had a ball going up there and visiting but anyway so uh, in this case what we have here we have a high concentration on the left so we have high over here and low over here and a semi-permeable membrane okay so what's going to happen is solutes are going to go this way okay for, with diffusion until they equal out so there's um and then solvent if it needs to will go back this way okay so solvent goes this way and solutes are going to the right 
so it equal, equalizes out. Next slide. Um, so here's, here's what happens. You see the solutes diffuse across, and then you end up with equal concentrations on both sides. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six over here, one, two, three, four, five, six over here of solute, mo solute molecules at equilibrium. Next slide. So then there's another um, set of phrases called hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic solutions. Tonicity is the amount of solute, solvent, sorry. Toni tonicity is the amount of solute in a solvent, okay? I, what I usually like to think of it is how much salt do you have in a solution? That makes it easier for me to remember. So tonicity is, so you, and uh, if, when you have hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic solutions, solutions is plural, so we're comparing two solutions. So if you have isotonic solutions, those two, two solutions have the same concentration, okay? So that's an isotonic solution. Wait, where's my cursor? There it is. Hypertonic, one solution has a greater concentration than the other solution, okay? So this would be isotonic is here, okay? We have the same number of molecules of solute on each side. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six over there. Okay, so it's isotonic solutions. They have the same concentration. <clears throat> Over here, we have this solution C has a higher concentration than solution D. So you compare solutions. So hypertonic means one solution has a greater concentration of solute than the other. So C is hypertonic to D. Okay, hypotonic means a solution has a lesser concentration of solute than the other. So since D has a lower concentration than C, C has a higher concentration than D. So C is hypertonic to D, D is hypotonic to C, okay? So there's, that's how hypertonic and hypotonic work. So next slide. And the reason this is important is you don't wanna give a hypertonic solution or a hypotonic solution and inject that in somebody's veins because uh, that could cause lots of problems. And let's see, um, here's just another diagram that I drew about uh, diffusion of water uh, is, um, is called osmosis. And so what will happen here is you have a low concentration on the right and a high concentration on the left. So water will diffuse across, water goes across. So the volume of solution goes up over here and down on the right, okay? So th they become equal in concentration. And the, uh, because the water moves, but the solutes don't, don't move. All right, next slide. So we talked about hypertonic and hypotonic solutions. So why, you know, why is this important? Well, with red blood cells, and they're running around in your blood, bloodstream, if you just inject water, um, well, let's, say, let's start off. If you inject um, normal saline, 0.9% sodium chloride, that happens to be um, the same concentration as, uh, as your blood plasma. So what will happen is if you put a red blood cell, this red blood cell right here in A, into an isotonic solution, it will maintain its shape, okay? It'll stay in this nice, uh, nice uh, concave shape and, and convex shape, right? So a little depression right in the middle where the nucleus used to be. <clears throat> um, if you take a red blood cell and put it into a hypotonic solution, okay? Here's, here it is. Water can go into and out of red blood cells. So if, it's, if the red blood cell is hypotonic, is, or is placed into a hypotonic solution, so the solution is hypotonic to the red blood cell, that means there's more salt inside the red blood cell than there is outside. So that means water is going to rush into the red blood cell to try to try to equalize the concentrations on either side of the, of the membrane of the red blood cell, and the cell is going to swell. And eventually what's going to happen is the swell will burst as the um, concentration of water increases. And you can actually do this on a microscope slide. You can take uh, blood and do a blood smear and then add some water to it and you'll you'll actually look a couple minutes later and your blood cells are they're gone because they're all they all swelled up and burst. So that's a, a red blood cell and a hypotonic solution there. What happens if you put a red blood cell in a hypertonic solution? Well a hypertonic solution means so it's red blood cell in a hypertonic solution. So that means the solution is hypertonic to the red blood cell. That means there's more salt outside the red blood cell than is inside the red blood cell, which means that water 
that tries to equalize concentration. So there's more salt outside, so water moves out of the cell to try to equalize the concentration inside and outside the cell. So the cell will shrink. Okay, so that's what this is showing here. Cell shrinks, and shrinkage is called crenation. So the cell crenates. And so shrinkage is called crenation. So the red blood cell crenates. Over here, in the, if it's placed in a hypotonic solution, it swells. In a hypertonic solution, it crenates. That doesn't even look like an R. So there you go. So, all right. So that's what happens with red blood cells and why it's important to use uh, normal saline for injections and don't use just uh, pure water or, uh, or a hypertonic solution, either one. All right, next slide.